In the mitosis discussion, we looked at the mechanisms that are involved with mitotic division in eukaryotic cells. And we've also had a bit of an overview of the eukaryotic cell cycle and the place of mitosis within that cell cycle. In this video, what I'll focus on is the regulation of growth and cell division in eukaryotic cells. And this quote by Dr. Andrew Murray from Harvard really sums it up very nicely. In a multicellular organism like an animal, normal cells obey strict rules. They divide only when told, and they would rather die than misbehave. Of course, what this is referring to is the fact that under normal circumstances, multicellular organisms have molecular mechanisms in place that will actually cause their cells to undergo programmed cell death if they are behaving abnormally and in such a way that they could pose a danger to the organism as a whole. We talked about that before in our cell signaling discussion. The mechanism for that is apoptosis. But how is that accomplished? What are the controls and checkpoints that are in play to ensure that cells behave like good citizens and don't divide out of control? First, I'm going to cover a couple of growth controls that are in place in multicellular organisms. Contact inhibition, sometimes referred to as density-dependent inhibition, and anchorage dependence. In an animal like us, most of our cells are growing in the context of solid tissues, similar to what we see here at the top. We see a layer of cells that are connected to one another through proteins in their membranes that form cell-cell junctions, illustrated in blue here. We talked about these in our cell structure discussion. Typically, these cells will also be joined to connective tissue in the extracellular matrix, illustrated as these little white lines underneath the cells. And this is what's connecting the cells to the rest of the body. These will also be membrane-embedded proteins that are connected up to the internal cytoskeleton of the cell, providing a structural linkage between the fibrous cytoskeleton and the fibrous extracellular matrix. If something happens, let's say there's an injury that's caused some of these cells to die, we end up with a gap in the tissue layer. Under normal circumstances, what's going to happen is that there's going to be growth factor signals secreted from these surrounding cells or other cells nearby that will activate cell division to produce new cells to fill the gap. Once that gap is filled in, and these cells form their attachments to one another and to the connective tissue layer underneath, cell division is going to stop. Making contact inhibits further cell division. That's what's referred to as contact inhibition. What's actually happening here is that these proteins that are making these connections are capable of initiating cell signaling pathways within these cells that inhibit further rounds of cell division. But if contact inhibition is lost, let's say there's a mutation that prevents that inhibitory signaling pathway from being transduced in the cell, we might see continued cell division, as shown here on the right, with overgrowth of cells forming a tumor. This would be the first of many steps needed for cancer to form. The second general growth control that's in play in a multicellular organism is referred to as anchorage dependence. As the name implies, under normal circumstances, cells have to be anchored to the rest of their tissue in order to survive. Again, we'll start with our solid tissue here with cells all connected to one another and to the extracellular matrix. Let's say these are liver cells. Imagine if a cell broke free from surrounding tissue. Would it be a good idea if these cells in liver could just sort of break free from their tissue layer, head off into the bloodstream and go and hang out in the lungs or in the brain? Obviously, that would be a really bad idea. In a multicellular organism, your cells and tissues and organs and organ systems have to maintain their structural interactions and interfaces with all of the other tissues and organs and organ systems in the body. And if cells could just go wandering, this would really muck that up. Under normal circumstances, this is not allowed to happen. And if a cell does break free of its tissue layer, then what actually occurs is that cell will initiate programmed cell death, apoptosis in animals. This is what's referred to as anchorage dependence. Just as we saw with contact inhibition, this relies on membrane proteins that initiate signaling pathways in the cell. In this case, the proteins are activating survival signals, but what they're actually doing is inhibiting the initiation of apoptosis. As long as these cells are attached to one another and attached to their connective tissue layer underneath, apoptosis is inhibited. But if the cells break free and lose their attachments, then that inhibitory signal is lost and apoptosis occurs, killing the cell, which is then removed from the body. 
If anchorage dependence is lost, let's say there's a mutation that prevents initiation of apoptosis, then you could actually have a cell break free and survive. This is the basic mechanism for how cancer cells spread from their original site to other organs in the body. We'll come back to that in a bit. Contact inhibition and anchorage dependence are both really important general growth controls that keep cells in check in multicellular organisms. What I want to talk about next is control at the molecular level. Here's a representation of the eukaryotic cell cycle we looked at last time, with interphase comprised of G1, where the cell is carrying out normal metabolism and functions, S phase, when the DNA is synthesized or copied, and G2, that second gap phase where DNA repair is finished and the organelles are duplicated. Interphase is followed by the mitotic phase here, which is comprised of mitosis, division of the nucleus, and cytokinesis, division of the cytoplasm and formation of two daughter cells. We know that these phases happen in sequence, but how does the cell know that it should move to the next stage? For example, how does the cell know that it should progress from G2 to mitosis and actually begin dividing in two? Obviously, there are a number of very important things that have to happen before it's safe to do so. How is this controlled at the molecular level? Progression through the cell cycle is regulated at key stages by what are called checkpoints, where the cell is checking to make sure either that it's necessary to move on to the next stage of the cell cycle, or that important molecular events that need to happen before the cell can move on to the next stage have actually occurred. There are three checkpoints. The first one controls passage from G1 to S phase. The second controls progression from G2 to mitosis. And the third checkpoint is at the metaphase to anaphase transition, which is also referred to as the mitotic or spindle checkpoint. Just by thinking about what's happening in each of those phases, we can figure out what the cell is likely to be checking for before it progresses to the next. At the G1 to S phase transition, what is the cell asking itself? It's asking itself, is it appropriate for me to make more cells? In other words, do I have permission to divide if we're talking about a multicellular organism, or can the environment support a larger population if we're talking about single-celled eukaryotes? Remember that single cells are limited largely by environmental conditions. Are there enough nutrients in our waste products reasonably low? But for a multicellular organism like an animal, the regulation is much more complex. That permission to divide is going to come in the form of growth factor signals that are usually coming from other cells to expand and divide. What about the transition from G2 to M? Here the cell needs to make sure that all of the cellular DNA has been replicated and that any DNA mutations or damage that have been detected has been completely repaired. In addition, the cell is going to be asking itself, have all of the cellular organelles been duplicated and am I a sufficient size to be able to support two new daughter cells? What's happening at the mitotic spindle checkpoint is what we saw illustrated in that movie that we watched in the mitosis video, where we saw kidney epithelial cells undergoing mitotic division. Remember that we saw that one straggler chromosome that wasn't correctly attached up? It was only attached to one of the spindle poles, and it got pulled to one side of the cell. What we saw in that case was that the cell did not proceed from metaphase to anaphase right away. It waited until that straggler chromosome was correctly connected up and was pulled to the metaphase plate and equal tension had been established. Only then did it move on to anaphase to separate those sister chromatids from one another and pull them to opposite poles of the cell. That was a good illustration of what the cell is checking for at this mitotic spindle checkpoint that regulates the progression from metaphase to anaphase. The cell has to make sure that all sister chromatids are correctly attached. In each checkpoint, the regulation from one stage to the next relies on a whole network of enzymes and other proteins that control what's happening in the cell. Two of these checkpoints have molecular mechanisms in common. The specific proteins are different, but they belong to the same class, and the regulatory mechanism is very similar. For example, the G1 to S and G2 to M checkpoints are both controlled by enzymes called cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs. We've talked about kinases before. These are the enzymes that phosphorylate targets using ATP, transferring a phosphate group from ATP to the target. The name cyclin-dependent kinase 
is kind of self-explanatory. These are kinases that are allosterically activated by the presence of another protein called a cyclin. The active CDK enzyme is actually a protein complex that consists of two proteins, the CDK enzyme itself and the regulatory protein, which is the cyclin. The mechanisms that regulate these two checkpoints are pretty similar to one another, and we're not going to learn the details of both of them. We're going to focus on the G2 to M transition, but everything we talk about is going to be very applicable to the G1 to S transition as well. It's a very, very similar mechanism. For both mechanisms, the presence or absence of cyclin protein alone is not sufficient to activate or inactivate the CDK enzyme. In fact, there are two requirements for activating the CDK enzyme. First, cyclin protein must be bound to CDK. And second, CDK has to be phosphorylated by other kinases in the correct pattern, meaning on the correct amino acids in the CDK polypeptide. So two modes of regulation occur. First, cyclin protein has to be present, and then the correct phosphorylation pattern has to be established on the CDK enzyme before it's activated. This little indentation here is meant to represent the active site of this enzyme complex. We're going to look at both of these mechanisms of regulation in more detail, but we're going to start with regulation of CDK activity by cyclin protein presence. So again, we're focusing on the transition from G2 to mitosis. When the cell is checking, is DNA replication complete? Has DNA repair been accomplished? And is the cell big enough before moving on and actually dividing up? What we see diagrammed here is the CDK that controls the progression to mitosis, what we'll refer to as the mitotic CDK, and the regulatory cyclin that binds to that mitotic CDK, what we call the mitotic cyclin. Cyclins are called cyclins because their expression varies throughout the cell cycle. It goes up and down. For example, for this mitotic cyclin CDK, in interphase, what we would see is that through G1, the levels of cyclin protein are pretty low. And then beginning in S phase, we start to see an increase in the amount of cyclin protein that's present. That concentration of cyclin protein peaks at the beginning of mitosis. And if we compare that to the activity of this complex, the CDK, remember it's the CDK that has the enzymatic activity, what we see is that the activity of the enzyme also peaks at the beginning of mitosis. Incidentally, here the CDK complex is referred to as MPF. Reflecting historical naming, this stands for maturation or mitosis promoting factor. It makes sense that if the activity of the enzyme is dependent on the presence of cyclin, then we would expect that its activity would peak at the same time that the expression of the cyclin peaks. As we track that cyclin protein concentration, what we see right here in the middle of mitosis is a dramatic drop off in the concentration of cyclin. Then, after the cell exits from mitosis and enters G1 again, we would start to see that gradual increase in cyclin starting to build up in the cell again. So this is why cyclins are called cyclins. Their expression level increases in predictable fashion in particular stages of the cell cycle, and then drops off again, increases and then drops off again, and so forth. The same thing would be observed for the cyclin-dependent kinase that's regulating progression from G1 to S. But as I said, we're not going to focus on that particular CDK. We're going to focus on the G2 to M CDK. Toward the end of the video, I'll talk more about how the cyclin gets degraded and what happens in the cell as a result. The second thing that's going to be required is the correct phosphorylation pattern being established on this CDK protein before it can actually start phosphorylating its targets. What are the targets of this activated CDK once it achieves full activation? I'm just going to add on that phosphate to make sure that everybody's recognizing that not only is the cyclin going to be present, but the CDK has to be correctly phosphorylated as well. Well, once that happens, and this is an activated enzyme complex, now there are many phosphorylation targets for the CDK enzyme. The first one is a set of proteins that are responsible for modifying chromatin structure. These are called condensins, and as their name implies, they are responsible for initiating the condensation or compaction of chromatin that we see happening at the earliest stages of prophase. Another set of target proteins are proteins that are associated with the nuclear envelope and the nuclear lamina. And when these proteins are phosphorylated, that triggers the fragmentation of the nuclear envelope. Proteins in the Golgi get phosphorylated 
and that's associated with fragmentation of the Golgi complex, which is necessary for cytokinesis to occur. And phosphorylation of microtubule-associated proteins and centrosome proteins is required in order to facilitate the rearrangement of the microtubule network in the cell to form the mitotic spindle. As you can see, all of these target proteins that are phosphorylated by CDK are proteins that are associated with the onset of prophase. All of these events that are being described here are essentially the beginning of mitosis, and the first stage of mitosis is prophase. So how does cyclin-dependent kinase get the correct phosphorylation pattern at this G2-M checkpoint? To understand that, we actually have to take a step back and think about what's happening during S phase. We know that the biggest thing that's happening during S phase is that the DNA is being copied. But as you can imagine, there's going to be a lot of genes whose expression gets ramped up in S phase in preparation for cell division. And one of those genes is the gene encoding the cyclin protein. So during S phase, as we saw in that previous graph, we start to see this dramatic rise in cyclin protein concentrations. CDK is already there in the cell. Its expression doesn't cycle, but it's inactive. So now we see the complex of cyclin and CDK forming beginning in S phase. But is this going to be an active CDK enzyme? No, because it doesn't have its correct phosphorylation pattern yet. So it will be in an inactive state. Establishing the correct phosphorylation pattern on this cyclin CDK complex is going to require enzymes that regulate the phosphorylation status of CDK. The first enzyme that we see coming into play here is an enzyme called WE1. WE1 is a kinase and it phosphorylates CDK in the active site. So this is an inactivating phosphate, preventing the enzyme from working because the phosphate is right here in the active site. So the CDK enzyme is still inactive. Next, we see the activity of a second kinase called CA kinase, which phosphorylates the CDK enzyme at a different distal amino acid position. This phosphate added by CAK is an activating phosphate. And if the active site phosphate is removed, we'll end up with an active enzyme. But right now that phosphate is still there, so CDK remains inactive. Now what type of enzyme have we talked about before that's responsible for dephosphorylating target substrates? That would be a phosphatase, and that's what we see coming into play next. There is a phosphatase enzyme called CDC25, and this phosphatase cleaves off the phosphate group that's in the active site, leaving only the phosphate on that distal site. Now this is an active CDK complex. At this point, the CDK enzyme can start phosphorylating its targets. We're gonna see phosphorylation of nuclear lamina proteins, condensins, microtubule associated proteins, and this is going to lead the cell right into prophase of mitosis. This activation of our cyclin CDK complex is happening at that G2 to M transition. When CDC25 phosphatase removes that phosphate group, this CDK enzyme actually takes the cell into mitosis. Okay, so logically, when does it make sense that this CDC25 phosphatase would be activated? Only when all of the events that are associated with S phase and G2 have been accomplished. As long as the cell is still trying to replicate its DNA and then check and make sure that it gets repaired if necessary, the cell does not want this CDK enzyme to be activated because that would prematurely trigger prophase before the cell is ready. To prevent that, this CDC25 enzyme is actually inhibited as long as there's ongoing DNA replication. So there's a whole set of proteins that are collectively referred to as checkpoint kinases that are involved with phosphorylating other proteins in the cell to regulate their activity as part of the cell cycle. And CDC25 itself is phosphorylated and inhibited as long as DNA replication is ongoing. So even though the cyclin CDK complex starts to accumulate beginning in S phase, it's not till much later that it gets activated. But remember that there are other things that the cell wants to check for as well. And the mechanism used to make sure that those have been accomplished relies on this WE1 kinase we just talked about before. Remember that WE1 kinase recognizes the CDK enzyme as a substrate. And when that active site is encountered, WE1 phosphorylates it. So even if CDC25 is activated and removing that phosphate group from the active site, 
If there's we one kinase in the cell, it's going to just add that phosphate group right back on, effectively flipping the switch on this CDK enzyme back to the off position. CDC25 activity is associated with activation of cyclin CDK. We one activity is associated with inactivation of cyclin CDK. We one activity is also controlled through phosphorylation and it is maintained in an active state as long as there is ongoing DNA repair or if the cell is small. Once DNA repair is complete and the cell is large enough, WE1 kinase gets inactivated. Now, when CDC25 removes the inhibitory phosphate in the active site of CDK, it stays off. There's no WE1 activity to add it back on. In this way, we see two separate pathways of regulation of cyclin CDK activity through phosphorylation. The first is detecting whether DNA replication has been fully accomplished, and that's through regulation of CDC25. And the second is detecting whether DNA repair has been accomplished and whether the cell is large enough to support two daughter cells. And that's through the regulation of We1. There's another little twist on this that actually provides an example of positive feedback. It turns out that another target of the cyclin CDK complex when it gets activated is the CDC25 protein itself. So when cyclin CDK is activated, it phosphorylates CDC25 in such a way as to make it even more active. And so CDC25 is going to dephosphorylate more cyclin CDK complexes, which will activate more CDC25, which will activate more cyclin CDK. You get the idea. And this rapid activation of CDK is going to lead to immediate onset of mitosis and entry into prophase. This type of positive feedback is useful for molecular events the cell wants to initiate and get through quickly, like mitosis. Now let's take a look at that spindle checkpoint and see how the cell regulates the passage from metaphase to anaphase. Remember that this is in the middle of mitosis and what the cell is checking for here is that all sister chromatids have been correctly attached. What we're going to see is that at this checkpoint, the regulation is going to be accomplished through protein degradation. This involves a protein complex called the proteasome, a large complex of proteins that degrades other proteins in the cell. The proteins that are to be degraded have to be marked with a little molecular signal and sent to the proteasome. And it's that sort of targeted protein degradation at play here. This involves tension sensing by proteins here in the kinetochore. When equal tension has been established on both of the sister chromatid kinetochores, that leads to the release of a protein called CDC20 from the kinetochore. CDC20 is a protein that allosterically regulates another protein complex called anaphase promoting complex or APC. APC is a type of enzyme called a ubiquitin ligase. Ubiquitin is a small molecule that can be added onto proteins. And once this ubiquitin tag has been added, that targets that protein to the proteasome to be degraded. In that way, the ubiquitin tag is a molecular signal in the cell that this specific protein needs to be sent for degradation. If we think about it, can we think of a protein that needs to be degraded in order to see that progression from metaphase, where all the chromosomes are lined up, to anaphase, where they're allowed to separate? Well, of course, we can see that getting rid of these cohesins is necessary to get that accomplished. Because once that happens, then the motor proteins that are on these microtubules would be able to start pulling these chromosomes apart. It's actually not quite that simple, though. It's a little bit of an indirect mechanism by which protein degradation leads to cohesins being cleaved. The enzyme that cleaves cohesin is called separase. Separase is allosterically inhibited by a protein called securin. So when securin is bound to separase, separase activity is inhibited and cohesins cannot be cleaved. So what actually gets targeted for ubiquitination, this little UB is just representing a ubiquitin molecule being added on by APC, is this securin protein. So this securin protein gets targeted to the proteasome for degradation. Once securin is gone, separase can go ahead and cleave these cohesins, and then we can see these sister chromatids being pulled in opposite directions.
And when we see that happening, we say that the cell is in anaphase. There's actually a second target of this anaphase promoting complex, because in addition to targeting securin for degradation, it targets mitotic cyclin. When cyclin gets ubiquitinated and it gets these little molecular tags added on, likewise cyclin is sent to the proteasome for degradation. Once CDK loses its bound cyclin protein, then that's effectively a molecular switch that flips this CDK enzyme back to its inactive state. So what's going to happen in the cell if there's no more CDK around phosphorylating nuclear lamina proteins and microtubule associated proteins and condensin proteins? Remember that whenever we have kinase pathways, there's going to be a corresponding phosphatase that can dephosphorylate the target. And it's the balance of activity between the phosphatase and the kinase that determines whether the target protein is phosphorylated or dephosphorylated. So if we lose our cyclin-dependent kinase activity, the phosphatases that recognize those same targets are going to dephosphorylate them. So the nuclear lamina and condensins and microtubule-associated proteins are going to be dephosphorylated. We'll see the DNA decondense, the nuclear envelope reform, and the microtubule network go back to its extended network shape. And when we see these events, we say that the cell is now in telophase. Telophase is essentially the reversal of prophase. So anaphase promoting complex does promote the onset of anaphase by causing the cleavage of cohesins by targeting the securin protein for degradation, but it's also responsible for triggering the onset of telophase by inactivating the cyclin CDK complex that was responsible for holding this cell in mitosis. All of these growth control and cell cycle checkpoint mechanisms for regulating cell division and cell growth in the context of an animal are really relevant to our understanding of how cancer develops and how it can spread and become malignant. As you can imagine, the onset of cancer is going to involve cells dividing out of control. We'll take, for example, formation of breast cancer. Mutations would have to occur in genes encoding signal transduction pathway proteins that are regulating cell division and how and when it occurs. There would need to be additional mutations that get rid of that growth control of contact inhibition, which will then allow too many cells to accumulate an extensive piling up of these cells. That's going to lead to a tumor, but not necessarily tumors that could become cancerous in the sense of becoming invasive and spreading to other parts of the body. This could, in theory, be a benign tumor that isn't causing much of a problem beyond taking up space and nutrients. For this tumor to really become a problem, further mutations would be required, so we start to see an expansion of that tumor and then an invasion of the surrounding healthy tissue. In theory, this still isn't too bad because at this point, it's pretty easy to get rid of it through surgery and via localized radiation therapy that would kill off that tumor in situ or where it sits in the body. Where cancer becomes very dangerous is when we lose that anchorage dependence and the cells can actually break free and instead of undergoing apoptosis, survive and migrate and ultimately encounter blood vessels and lymphatic vessels that move fluid throughout the body. Once the tumor cells reach those circulatory vessels, then they can start to circulate throughout the body and they can travel and set up what are called second site tumors in other areas of the body, a process called metastasis. Once that happens, this becomes much more difficult to treat and requires a more systemic intervention like chemotherapy. But because we have multiple redundant growth control and cell division regulatory mechanisms, multiple mutations have to occur no matter what type of cancer you're talking about. As you can imagine, because apoptosis is a pathway that is triggered when cells are behaving badly, in order for any of this to occur, we really have to have mutations that are inactivating the normal onset of programmed cell death. And mutations that affect apoptosis are very frequently associated not only with breast cancer, but lots of other types of cancer in the body. This video has provided a quick overview of the growth controls and checkpoints that regulate cell division and progression through the cell cycle, and a bit more detail on the molecular mechanisms regulating the G2-M to M and spindle assembly checkpoints.
Next, we move on to the topic of meiosis, the form of cell division used to produce gametes in sexually reproducing organisms.